This morning, I'm sharing the message with us on the topic, faithfulness. Faithfulness is an important word that the Bible commands for every believer. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. This is what God requires of stewards. You know, in those parables where uh, in the Bible, where Jesus made use of stewards, those stewards represented the Christians, the believers who are serving their master. And one of the uh, reasons that the master rewarded them when he came back is because they were faithful in their service. And the ones who were not safe, uh, faithful were thrown out, they were destroyed, and their lives were completely uh, ended. In today's world, we find that faithfulness is one of the things that is very scarce because people just want to make progress at all costs. They want to be happy at any cost. They want to just feel free among themselves, not be bound by anything, no rules, no regulation, nothing whatsoever. They just want to be themselves, be happy, and so on. And because of that, this quality of faithfulness gets neglected to the background. As we look at this word faithfulness, um, I checked the dictionary to find out what does that word actually mean? How do secular people look at it when they are defining it in dictionary? Of course, there are many dictionaries today, and you can just go on internet and search things out, and uh, you will get a, a number of them and comparisons as well. Now, in the dictionary, faithfulness is defined both as an adjective and as a noun. As an adjective, it is defined as number one, strict or thorough in the performance of duty. Number two, true to one's word, promises, vows. In other words, the person that remains true to his word, his promises, and his vows. Number three, he says steady in allegiance or affection. The person is loyal and is constant. And number four, he says it is reliable, trusted, or believed. Dictionary also defines the word faithfulness as a noun. And as a noun, it also brings out four different characteristics. Why am I going to do this? To help us understand what we are talking about and what it means in normal, natural language. Number one, as a noun, it says it is lasting loyalty and trustworthiness in relationships, especially marriage and friendship. Number two, it says it is the facts or quality of being true to one's word or commitment as to what one has pledged to do, professes to believe, etc. And number three, it says the facts or quality of being dedicated and steadfast in performing one's duty, working for a cause, etc. And number four, it says it is the quality of adhering to facts, standards, or an original or an or accuracy. So those are the different words, different ways that dictionary looks at this word uh, uh, faithfulness. And then I decided to check on the synonyms. Synonyms are other words that can be used in place of faithfulness. So what are other words that are similar in meaning to faithfulness? The Bible, sorry, the dictionary uh, uh, say number one, fidelity. Two, loyalty, I will leave off the counting. Uh, then the next is constancy. Next is devotion, trueness, true heartedness, dedication, commitment, 
allegiance, adherence, dependability, reliability, trustworthiness, staunchness, steadfastness, field, filthy, filthy is spelled F-E-A-L-T-Y. And I check what that means. It says a pledge of allegiance from one person to another. Accuracy is the next one. Precision, exactness, closeness, strictness, fairness, justness, factuality, truth, truthfulness, veracity, authenticity, and veridicality. I had to check the meaning of that one because it's not a common word that we use every day. And uh, it tells me that that is a semantic or grammatical assertion of the truth of an utterance, asserting the truth of an utterance. So faithfulness is very important. Why is it so important to God? Because God himself is a faithful God. In fact, David described God as the God that is faithful in keeping his words and promises. And it's because of that, that we can trust in him. We know he will not fail. We know he will answer our prayers. We know he is with us. We know that if we stand on his word, we will get what he has promised them. In Psalm chapter 15, verse 1 to 5, the Bible tells us, describes to us the importance of being faithful. If he actually started by asking a question. He says, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And then in answering that question, you see faithfulness coming through them, which is why it's so important, especially in these last days, that if we want to make heaven and want to live as God wants us to live, then we must maintain faithfulness in every aspect of life. Yes, it's, this becomes more important when things do not go right when it doesn't feel like keeping to your word and doing what you are already pledged yourself to do. Now, the answer that we're given to those questions, those two questions are, number one, he that backbited not with his tongue, nor do it evil to his neighbor, nor take it up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a file person is contemned, but he honored them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart, and change it not. I want you to pay attention to that phrase. He that sweareth to his own heart and change it not. In other words, that person is faithful to the covenant, to the commitment to the, uh, uh, that he made, uh, agreements that were made, vows that were made, he sticks to it. He that put it not, uh, not out his money on usury, to usury, nor take a reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. That's a quality that will qualify a person to make heaven. And of course, if at the end of life, a person doesn't make heaven, where will that person be? The alternative is hell fire. And I pray none of us will ever get to such a place like that. In looking at this uh, topic, I want to consider two aspects. Uh, the first one would be the characteristics of unfaithfulness. What are the things that can happen in the life of a person that will tell you this person ha has symptoms, characteristics of unfaithfulness? It's not faithful to God, not faithful to the word of God. Number two, I will look at the consequences of unfaithfulness. If somebody is unfaithful, what are the consequences? And finally, uh, I said two parts, but I could just add the third part with the conclusion, just to round up everything. Now, characteristics. What are they? Uh, I, I would just mention a few of them. Doesn't mean I'm going to cover everything, especially as our time is limited. The first characteristics of unfaithfulness is an independent spirit. When a person just decide to be independent, uh, go his own way or her own way, doesn't observe the covenant, doesn't want to be part of a group, 
or those things, just, just take the law into his or her hand and begin to act because he doesn't agree with what everybody uh, agrees to, what the Bible says should be done. I'm talking about what in terms of what the Bible says it should be done. You remember in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, the religious people called the apostles, they beat them and they threatened them and said they mustn't preach in the name of Jesus any longer. But the, 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 the disciples told them, you better judge it for yourself, whether it is better to obey you or to obey God. But for us, we are going to remain faithful to God. In other words, we won't agree with your edict. We won't agree with your commandment, which is wrong, but we will keep to our commitment to the almighty God. So yes, a person can disagree with what is wrong, but when a person chooses to live independent, independently of what is right, because he doesn't want to obey, he doesn't want to commit to maybe uh, the right thing, then that is a mark of independence. Uh, and that is a mark of unfaithfulness. There are a few examples in the Bible uh, uh, that testified to this. this. There is a man called Joel. He was the commander in chief of the armed forces of Israel when David was the king of Israel. David, sorry, uh, sorry, Joab had an independent spirit. He will just take the law into his hand and do whatever he, he feels is right to him, which may not be in line with what the king wants. I mean, King David was appointed by God. A prophet Samuel went and anointed him to be the king in Israel. And so he was ruling under God's authority. And God expected all his subjects, including Joab, to simply obey. If he gave a command, even though he may not say, God told me this, God asked me to do this, that command came from God and was supposed to be, or be, be followed. How was that independent attitude manifested? On one occasion, Abner, who was the captain under King Saul, came to visit David. He wanted to transfer his allegiance to David. And David received Abner. David welcomed him. David agreed with him uh, uh, to accept him. And David sent him away in peace. When Joab came back and heard that Abner had come, Abner was an enemy, a rival to Joab, Joab would have told, if Abner come, then he was a captain of the whole of Israel. Maybe I will lose my position. And besides, Abner was uh, the, the one that killed my brother. Uh, so he didn't want Abner to, uh, to have a good relationship with David. And so he sent for Abner, independent spirit. When Abner came, he killed Abner. He just destroyed him there. And it wasn't at the will of David that Abner should be killed. Joab did that on his own because he thought that was good for his own career good for his own protection for his own. When you now do things independently by your own, because you think that is good for you, good for your career, good for your future, but independent of the word of God, independent of uh, the divine authority over you, that is a sign of unfaithfulness. Another example happened when Absalom, Absalom was the son of David. Absalom wanted to become a king. He rebelled against the father, mobilized an army, and when the battle was to be waged, David commanded all the soldiers. David appointed three captains and commanded all of them. He says, please deal gently with that young man, Absalom. In other words, don't kill him. You have heard it. They went into the battle. And as God would have it, Absalom caught, caught his hair, caught, caught on the branches of the tree. And he was hanging there between life and death. And people came and told Joab, uh, Joab, Absalom is caught in the branches of the tree. And David said, why didn't you kill him? Why do you just come and tell me stories? And the people said, we heard it clearly. When David said, we must not kill him. And if, uh, even if you were to keep us in your whole house, we wouldn't do it because we will be disobeying the commandment of the king. And Absalom, sorry, Joab got up and said, I may, I may not waste time with you. He just went and killed him. He acted independently on his own against the instruction that he was given 
by the superior. When a person act, has the tendency of acting independent, independently against your uh, authority, against the instruction that is been given, that is a sign of unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness, not just to that individual, but it is an unfaithfulness to God. Remember when Samuel sent Saul to go and kill, uh, fight in battles two on two occasions, and Saul didn't do exactly what uh, Samuel told him. When he came back, Samuel told him, you have disobeyed God. He didn't say you disobey me. That was unfaithfulness to God that uh, <clears throat> I've asked Samuel to instruct Saul to do those things. The second characteristics of somebody that is unfaithful is when this person easily takes offense at anything, even minor thing, and does not allow that offense to be, uh, uh, to be eradicated. He will build up a case because of offenses. And sometimes the offenses may be as a result of misinterpretation of things. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us in Matthew 20, 14, many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Getting offended, uh, 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 allowing the spirit of offense to fester in your life, open the door to the spirit of treachery. Never forget these hurts and offenses usher people down the road of disloyalty. Offended people eventually become disloyal. I was listening to a man of God preaching yesterday, and he said, do you know why Jesus Christ prayed on the cross and said, uh, uh, <clears throat> Lord, um, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's because he didn't want offense to stay in his mind. He didn't want to <clears throat> die with offense in his heart, with bitterness in his heart. So he had to forgive. The Bible says we need to forgive. Offenses will come, no doubt, but we've got to live above it. If we are always getting offended and then reacting and taking up fight because of those offenses and so on, and not allow the word of God to dwell, dwell in our heart and rule in our lives, it would lead to unfaithfulness and to disloyalty. Another characteristic in the life of a person that is unfaithful is passivity. When a person is passive, he says, okay, I'm offended because of that. I won't flow with you anymore. I won't do what you tell me to do. I will just maybe uh, 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 become passive, not take active part in anything, not do what needs to be done. And the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 10, such a, such a person comes under a curse. Because God says, the cause be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cause be he that keepeth back his soul from the blood. That person becomes passive. He doesn't really put in all the effort. He doesn't carry on with what he needs to do. Now, a good example in the Bible we see of that is in the life of Absalom with his brother Amnon. You remember the story? You can read it in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 22. Amnon has done something that was wrong. Amnon raped his sister, and that sister was the same mother with Absalom. But the Bible tells us, and Absalom, in verse 22, Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For two good years, no speaking of good or bad. When people become passive, they don't communicate. They don't share. They don't uh, 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 relate to an individual. It is a sign of unfaithfulness. There is something lurking in the heart. Two good years, no discussion, no fellowship. And you are brothers and sisters. You are from the same father. You are living in the same estate, belonging to David. Nothing passive. It is a sign of danger. And uh, as you go on later on in verse 28, you will notice an Absalom commanded his servant saying, Mark ye now when Absalom's heart is merry with wine. And when I say unto you, smite Abnon, then kill him. Fear not, have, have not I commanded you be courageous. All through that time he was passive. He was plotting something evil in the heart and looking for the right opportunity to bring that thing to pass. Passivity is a sign of uh, unfaithfulness. 
Then other characteristics is criticalness, be, becoming critical, uh, always criticizing, finding fault uh, with what is going on with people of God, with other people. So you see, there are many examples of this in the Bible. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, we saw Miriam and Aaron. They were all under Moses, even though both of them were older than Moses. But they were under the leadership of Moses. We are told here they spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Critical attitude. You're always finding fault with what your leader is doing, with what another person is doing. That is generally a sign, a mark of unfaithfulness. And uh, <clears throat> another example we can see in the Bible is in the strategy that Absalom adopted when he wanted to become a king. You find the story in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. In fact, you can read more of uh, the, uh, the entire chapter. When anybody come, came to see the king, Absalom will stand at the gate. Absalom will go and kiss the person, will embrace the person, and will say, what is your matter? Why have you come to see the king? And Absalom will tell the person, see, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. In other words, the king is too busy. The king is too old. The king doesn't have time for you. I am the one that has time to come and kiss you and embrace you and talk to you and all these kind of things. But he had something else in his own mind. In other words, he was complaining against the king that the king is too busy. The king is lazy. The, thing is, the king is not doing his job. That is why there is nobody to listen to your case. But actually what he was doing, the Bible says he stole the minds of the people away from King David. That is why he was able to mobilize them and said, I'm now going to become a king. Let's go and fight against that old man, David, and remove it. Think about it. He was the son of David. Rising up against his father to go and fight against the father. Let's kill my father so that I will become a king. How dangerous it is. Now, the next thing is um, from criticalness. In fact, criticalness leads to the next step here we find here becoming political. Political is when somebody doesn't, to keep, doesn't want to keep his offense to himself. He doesn't want to keep the criticisms to himself. He wants to enlist other people to uh, take his or her viewpoint and to join his or own, own side of the story. So you know, just like politicians go on campaign, to start uh, 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 speaking to people and getting people to vote for them, this person uh, does the same thing. You see that in Absalom. In Absalom chapter 15, verse 3 and 6, Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear this. And verse 6 says, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to see uh, the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He wanted to get their support, win their support, win them over to himself. So that is why he was becoming that political. And when a person just decides to be telling the bad stories, uh, critical stories, and maybe against a leader to other people, he wants those other people to join him or her against maybe. Uh, the leader or against a man of God. And the Bible is telling us that is a characteristic of unfaithfulness. Now, uh, deception is uh, another characteristic. Now, uh, be, uh, just be, first know that that um, a tendency of political, uh, being uh, political uh, to gain other people's support and sympathy, make them to join your side is a, is a, a character flaw uh, uh, that actually reveals unfaithfulness. These loyal people have an insidious way of discussing the shortcomings of their leaders. Gradually, they spread their dissenting feelings to a group of callable Christians so as to win them over to their side. You know, when Absalom wanted to now uh, 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 um, enthrone himself as king, the Bible said he selected 200 people. 
to go with him to a place of coronation. But the Bible says those people were just simple people that did not even know what was going on and what was going to happen because it's won their heart. That is uh, the outcome of his political decision. Now, deception is the next characteristic that I want to mention here. And many um, rebellious people are deceived into thinking that they are greater than their superiors. The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, verse 12, Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. God, Jesus actually promised that we will do greater works than himself, but that does not make us bigger and greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 13, verse 13, the first chapter 13, verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So Jesus will always remain greater. And anybody that wants to rise up <clears throat> and fight against and claim that I am greater, well, that person is deceived. And there are many times people get deceived to think, oh, I'm better than this. I can preach better. I can do better. I can lead better and so on. This is what happened when Satan, uh, who was you know, originally an angel of God, rebelled against God. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14, verse 12 and 13, and then verse 17, he says, thou art the anointed cherub that cover it. I have, said, uh, I have said this so. So it is God that set him so. He set him to become a worship leader in heaven. He set him to become a person that was uh, to lead many other, in fact, to lead all the angels and all the all other creatures and take the worship from them unto God. But look at from verse 12 to 13. Son of man, take up a lamentation a, 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 upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, uh, the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That is what Satan was before his, his fall. And it was that wisdom and beauty that made him think, yes, I can now become like God. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and jasper, the uh, and sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, and the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thine heart was lifted up because of your beauty. That is always the cause. The heart gets lifted up. I mean, more important than these people. These people don't recognize my importance. They don't value me. They don't respect me. They don't understand how worthy I am. Therefore, I'm going to prove to the whole world that I'm going to become like God. And because of that had lifted up, we are told, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy bright, uh, brightness. And God says, I'm going to cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee bare. I will lay thee before a king that they may behold thee. So, deception is what makes people to become unfaithful. They get deceived to think I am better. I am not valued. I am not given the importance and that I I, I ought to be. Uh, Absalom was very gifted, but it was deception that made him to think that he was better than David, uh, that, okay, David is too old, he's not passing judgment and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and he turned around. And basically, he was mocking the father. And God said in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17, the eye that mocked at his father and despised to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagle shall eat it. So, that is a serious uh, characteristics, deception. Don't be deceived. That is why the Bible tells us we need to be humble. Humble ourselves before God and walk as God wants us to, 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 to walk. Another characteristic of unfaithfulness is open rebellion. That is when these people now openly rebel 
I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to obey you. I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to stand up. Open rebellion. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, we are told, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against uh, uh, his angels. That was open rebellion, open fight. Satan decided, I'm going to fight against you, and we'll see who will win. Open warfare is a thing that is not right against God. What was Satan thinking? That he, a creator, can overthrow God? <laughs> that is the, the worst deception he got into. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11 and 22, look at what David said. David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeked my life. He was talking about Absalom. That was open rebellion. When Absalom mobilized the troops and took them to go and fight against David. Before he went to fight against David, he did something else. They set up a chamber on top of uh, the, the roof for him to uh, uh, go in and mess up with David's concubines that were left behind to keep the house. That was open rebellion to say, David, I am against you. Look at me sleeping with your wives. Uh, that was open uh, re rebellion. Another person that got into this open rebellion was Judas Iscariot. In Matthew 24, verse 47 and 48, we are told, and while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him uh, a great multitude with sword and staff that was openly coming against Jesus Christ to destroy, uh, to uh, 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 betray Jesus and get him be, uh, uh, betrayed. In verse 48, now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. Openly come with enemies to arrest Jesus Christ, to destroy Jesus Christ. Our time is almost up for a self-tourist exited. I want to round up very briefly uh, in terms by looking at the consequences. Consequences of this, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. A person may say, I'm not a witchcraft. I'm not this and that. But the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has also rejected thee from being king. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 18, God was telling people, thou shalt not suffer a wish to live. Remember, he's saying that a rebellion is as witchcraft, and he's saying that a wish should not live. In other words, death is pronounced against people that are unfaithful. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 11, <clears throat> We are told, and with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. They just followed. Don't be a simpleton. Simply following because the person looks attractive, he looks wise, he looks that he's going to win, and so on. Don't just follow. Analyze things. Think things through, and be able to uh, 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 decide what is right. Otherwise, you will get the consequences that belong to such people. Now, I mentioned a number of people in the Bible that uh, manifested these characteristics. What consequences did they attract in their life? Number one, Lucifer. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we are told, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, uh, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, and he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out from him. He was expelled from heaven, and he will be born in the lake of fire, eternal death. So dead, eternal death is the portion for these people, execution or death. Concerning Absalom, what happened when Absalom rebelled against his father? The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 15. And ten young men that bear Job's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. God will never support a rebel. A person that is unfaithful 
No matter how bright they may be, no matter how charismatic they may be, God will never support. God will never sponsor them. Absalom died because of unfaithfulness to his father. In 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23, we hear of another man called Ahithophel. Ahithophel was a, a confidant of David, an advisor to David. But when Absalom decided to take over the kingdom, he defected to Abs Absalom's side. And in uh, this passage, we are told, and when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and cut him home to his house, uh, to his city, and put his household in order and hung himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. He died dead is the consequences of people that are unfaithful. So this thing is serious. And we need to think about it seriously uh, uh, and get ourselves out of it so that we will not uh, uh, face these consequences. Another example is Shimei. When David ran away, Shimei was the one that was, uh, <clears throat> that was uh, uh, cursing David, throwing sand and stones. So in this place, First Kings chapter 2, verse 46, we are told, so the king, King Solomon now, commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, which went out and fell upon him, and he died. And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Shimei died because of his unfaithfulness. What about Adonijah? Adonijah was another person, son of David, that wanted to take the kingdom to himself. Look at what happened. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him that he died. Dead always come to unfaithful people. And what about Judas Iscariot that betrayed Jesus Christ? Matthew 27 verse 5 tells us, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. So all these people died because of their unfaithfulness. Very, very important. I've come to these characteristics and consequences for two reasons. Number one, I want you to use this as a mirror to examine yourself. Am I being unfaithful? Is any of these characteristics manifested in my life? And if so, you repent, come out of it so that you will be faithful unto God and escape the consequences. Number two, you will also use this to uh, check uh, on other people. If you notice anybody manifesting any of these, it should give you a warning message that that person is unfaithful and you should find ways of helping those people uh, uh, recover. And you wouldn't be foolishly just following those people in everything they do uh, along the lines of unfaithfulness. Uh, so you won't get into the consequences that these people got to. Finally, conclusion. The Bible tells us in the Verse I started with First Corinthians chapter four, verse two. It says, "Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, a woman be found faithful." That is God's requirement for you, and that is the requirement He will use to assess who gets to heaven. And you need to make up your mind: I will be faithful in everything I do. The Bible also tells us in Hebrews chapter twelve, verse fourteen: "Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which." No man shall see the Lord. If we are not following all these, the Bible says we shall not see the Lord. And if we won't see the Lord at the end of our life, where are we heading to? I want us to go to the Lord now in prayer. You've heard the word of God on the importance of faithfulness, being faithful to God and living a life of faithfulness. You've seen the characteristics, the things that will help you assess yourself. Uh, whether you are faithful or not, and then come back to the right path. We want to call upon God now. I want you to pray. I want you to ask God to help you to become faithful, to live for God, and to work for God all the days of your life. You will be faithful. You will be uh, honest. You will maintain integrity. Remember uh, uh, all those definitions of faithfulness that we uh, looked at originally. Do you have all those things? Fidelity, loyalty, constancy, devotion, trueness, true-heartedness, dedication, commitment, allegiance, adherence, dependability, reliability, trustworthiness, staunchness, steadfastness, uh, filthy, uh, uh, feel not F-I-L-T, but F-E-A-L-T-Y, accuracy, precision, exactness, closeness, strictness, 
fairness, justness, factuality, truth, truthfulness, veracity, authenticity, veridicality. Do you have these qualities in your life? Ask God to help you, to strengthen you, to create in you the type of heart that will make you faithful in everything in Jesus' name.